Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Geographic Society of Chicago's Women in Geography webinar series. I'm Nicolette Marasa from the GSC office, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Just a reminder, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We'll do our best to get to all of them, time permitting. If this is your first time attending a GSC event, welcome and thank you for tuning in. The Geographic Society of Chicago has educated the public about geography and its important uses since 1898. Today's GSC trains students in the latest geospatial technologies. Through services such as our geospatial technology programs, we offer unique educational experiences that harness the power of maps and the integrative tools of GIS to solve in environmental and community issues. There are a few other upcoming events. On November 21st, we have a travelogue on Parma and you can register for that now. As well as December 7th, we're gonna be having our Geo Trivia at Leader Bar and registration for that will be coming out on the website very shortly. So keep in touch with us there. Today's presenter, is Judith Bach, Director of Online Geospatial Programs at the at Elmhurst College. Judy will lead us through the life of GSC founder, Zonia Baber, and the process of the Geographic Society's uh, beginning. Judy, thank you so much for joining us today and presenting on Zonia Baber. Yes, thank you, Nicolette. I'm I'm really pleased and very honored actually to be presenting about the founder of our organization, of our society. So any more announcements that you need to make? No, oh, we are all set to get started. Okay. All right. Let me um share my screen. So um as I said, it really is um an honor to be sharing information about the founder, founder of the Geographic Society of Chicago. Uh, when uh, this series began, the Women in Geography series, it's an honor of our 125th anniversary of the founding of the Geographic Society of Chicago. And as we think about, um, if some of you heard the, the previous webinar by uh, Caroline Tork Torkelson about Annie Smith, um, Peck, uh, who is a, a Pan American explorer, um, Caroline, you know, really talked about. She says, "Oh, I followed in the footsteps," and she and she really had that really planned. I have to say, when I started thinking about doing a presentation about Zonia Baber, it really was, "Oh, she was the founder of our society, and wouldn't it be cool just to know a little bit more about her?" So this is really much more of a biography. Although now, you know, there's so many things that I found that um, there's sort of a uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm feeling a kinship to her in many ways, especially in terms of geographic education, the more I find out about her. So we know she was the founder of the Geographic Society of Chicago. Uh, she was a geographer, geologist, a teacher, an inventor. She was a principal. Um, she was an activist in both environmental and social arenas, um, a suff suffragette, and a pacifist. Um, so, I mean, she really has, the, you know, uh, just such a variety of things in her background. And I learned a lot about her as I was putting together <clears throat> this presentation. She was born in Clark County, Illinois, which is a southeastern Illinois near Terre Haute, Indiana, um, in 1862. So sort of in the, the midst of the Civil War. Her father, uh, his name was Amos Baber. He had, I think it was four brothers and three sisters. Um, little is known about her mother, Nancy, other than um, Amos died when uh, Zonia was about eight years old and um, Nancy did remarry. And, uh, you know, so, you know, we know that little bit about them. The picture that you see here, I found on the internet and it said that it was a Baber homestead. So I don't know if it was their homestead or someone else's because there are many Babers that live in that particular region of Illinois. <clears throat> Zonia had an older sister whose name was Laura, who did get married. Her last name was Schneider. 
And uh, at times she lived in Portland, Oregon. There's a lot of reference to Zonia visiting her in Negotia, Kansas. And then she did come back to Chicago in the last couple of years of her life when Zonia nursed her um, when she was in very ill health and she died in 1947. And Zonia evidently was with her in those last couple of years. And her sister had one son that, um, that we know of. She also, according to some sources, said that there, there was a younger brother also named um, Amos after his father. And after her mother remarried, there was a younger stepsister, Sylvia, born. But, you know, not a whole lot. You know, you go back into the records of the 1800s. Sometimes you don't find out a lot of information. Well, in terms of schooling at that time and the, you know, right after the Civil War, um, living in a fairly rural area. Uh, so the orangey. Um, color is Clark County, where uh, she was born. It's just said that she went to elementary school there. However, when she wanted to go to high school or to get further education, there was no high school in, in her area. So she went north to live in Edgar County, which is in the, the pink, is shaded in pink here, and lived with one of her uncles. So presumably one of her father's brothers. Uh, the dot that you see there is Paris, Illinois which is where um, her uncle lived. She graduated from high school in 1882. And then there's reference to her having taught some elementary grades in a country school for about the next year or two. Now I put Kansas, Illinois with a lot of question marks here. Kansas, Illinois is in the southwestern corner of Edgar County. So very close to Clark County because that appeared in a lot of references to her in terms of early schooling, whether she went to school there um, I'm wondering if maybe she might have taught there, but um, often we see that reference to Kansas, Illinois, and it is in that region. Uh, she really wanted to go on to further education. So she taught school for a couple years, um, presumably in Clark or Edgar County, and um, then moved to Englewood, which at that time was a suburb of Chicago. Today we know it as a neighborhood within Chicago. And she attended the Cook County Normal School. Normal schools means that it was a, an institution for training uh, people to become teachers. So when you ever see normal school, that's what that means. So she took her professional uh, teacher training courses and she graduated from that Cook County Normal School in 1885 with her teaching credentials. Um, at that time, Colonel Francis Parker was working at that school and he's gonna come up again in our conversation. So um, she met him very early on um, you know, as she was becoming a, a teacher, a young teacher. And I just wanted to, to mention him there. He was very progressive in his thoughts about education. So after she graduated from there, she moved to Ohio for a couple of years and she was a principal at um, the Hillside State School. And again, I'm gonna mention Flora Cook, who is a teacher from Ohio that she met there because she became a lifelong friend um, to Zonia. Um, some of the references, you know, they were friends for like 60 years. So, you know, uh, really had built a very um, solid friendship over the years of, of teaching and traveling together. Uh, in 1887, so after a couple of years, she returned back to uh, the Englewood neighborhood and taught at the Cook County Normal School. And um, a couple of years after that, she was promoted to being the head of the Department of Geography there. So her background and her interests in geography seemed to stem from some of her early, early years living on a farm, being able to be outside playing, um, investigating what was around her um, on that particular farm. And it was at that time as well, when she returned to the Cook County Normal School, that she talked to um, Colonel Parker, Francis Parker, and said, hey, I met this teacher in Ohio. I really think you need to recruit her to come here and, and teach because she had some of those same progressive, innovative ideas. And he did, um, with the provision that uh, Zonia would kind of overlook <laughs> and look over what whatever Flora was doing that, you know, um, I'm not sh sure, ex you know, he, he put her in her charge. For most of um, Zonia's life, she was a resident either of Englewood or the Hyde Park neighborhoods. And it wasn't until later in her life in 1949, the last uh, few years of her life, that she moved to East Lansing, Michigan, where she lived with her niece, Helen Baber Muncie. Um, until her death. So she was a Chicago resident. I did find one reference to an address in Washington, D.C. So perhaps she lived in Washington for a short while, or at least had, uh, it was renting a place there for a short while, but mostly, a, a, you know, a, a true Chicagoan. 
we know her as the founder of the Geographic Society of Chicago. And for our uh, Women in Geography's webinar series, how fitting it is to actually present something about our founder. Um, she really was, she was excited in, you know, in around the 1888 kind of time, you know, really excited about doing something about, you know, forming a group of people that had a common interest in geography. And so she pulled together some people that um, she knew, you know, from the Englewood and Hyde Park neighborhoods and from um, the Cook County Normal School and um, had a meeting. What she was proposing is that there would be a group called the Geographic Society of Chicago that might be fashioned after the National Geographic Society in Washington, D.C. And so it wasn't just professional geographers, but it was meant to be for all people. It was meant to help educate people about what geography was, um, to have lectures, to have field excursions. Um, and, you know, my favorite line, and, you know, the public may be brought to understand the importance of geography. So what you see on the right are the very first minutes of that very first meeting, actually um, designated as the preliminary um, meeting to the organization of the society. So that preliminary meeting was, should we really do this? And um, I, so there were several people there, um, R.D. Salisbury, who was a professor at the University of Chicago, who Zonia knew, um, Kate Kellogg, Mr. Pete, Mr. Kummel, and Wallace Atwood, who's known in environmental education pretty well. So, you know, this group of people came together in her home and they had this meeting and they decided, yes, we are going to form this organization. The very first official meeting was April, 1898. And in the ledger, uh, Zonia is listed as member number two. Um, I'm assuming that the president, Roland Salisbury was member number one. Um, and for that, she was um, became the very first vice president of the society. Um, in that ledger, um, there's a number of years across the top and shows that she paid her dues. And the dues were $2 a year. She did become a lifelong member of the society, which one would expect. Uh, so 1901 is when she actually became president of the Geographic Society. Um, what was fun was going through the archives of the society and, you know, through the boxes and through the scrapbooks and, and kind you know, paging through things <clears throat> to find out information. And so it was in this particular brochure that you can see that president, Miss Zonia Baber. And also in that 1901 year, um, she was going to be presenting, um, yes, here in March, um, ab about um, the teaching of geography. And the thing that was interesting about that is that in that particular lecture, she was using illustrations from her students um, to help, you know, for the, the lecture that she was giving. Notice that the society not only had programs um, in terms of lectures, but they also had field excursions. And so in that same little brochure, just like we send out um, announcements, you know, via email today, or, you know, it's on the internet. This was the way of communicating to the society members what was going on. And so they did have different trips. Dune Park is what we know today as Indiana Dunes National Park. Um, they took trips like to Highwood, Glencoe, Wilmette, and they were looking at landscapes and the ravines and the cliffs over the, the lake, um, and even went to Starved Rock. So she served on, as a director of the Geographic Society of Chicago until 1946, um, just 10 years before her death. Um, she was 83 years old in 1946. So she served a very long term <laughs> of being a director. Um, during that time, she did various presentations. And again, you kind of find bits and pieces as you go through the different um, parts of the archives. Um, it shows that she gave a presentation about China um, in 1900. And again, that lecture that she used illustrations from her students. In 1905, she did a lecture about the transcontinental trip of the 8th International Geographic Con Congress. So it was a group of people, international people who came and they traveled through six different cities. Uh, and she was part of that group. And then she gave a lecture about it. And then a little bit later on, you know, talking about aspects of South America. She had traveled all around the world. So she had quite a repertoire of uh, things to talk about. 
She always supported all the work of the society. And the society, if you recall, as Nicolette was talking, you know, we're um, very involved in thinking about um, the environment and how to bring this to the public. And this, this stems from our very beginnings. So early on, um, the society was very interested in protect, protecting the An Indiana Dunes. Zonia went there as a student um, when she was uh, attending classes. And uh, she also took her students there to study geology in the field. And they realized what um, sort of a valuable piece of property it was in terms of looking at dune development and nature and environment. And so along with several other organizations, some from the Chicago area and some from Indiana, there was a, you know just a whole group of people who wanted to protect the dune area. Um, Along with that, people in Indiana, I have to say, according to what I was reading, were a little suspicious about the Chicago people and, and their motives for wanting to save the dunes. And perhaps that's why it became Indiana Dunes State Park first. And, you know, it was kind of held within the state. And then there was still another area. One of the major concerns was that the area was becoming more and more industrial. Not only did the steel factories kind of set up business there, but there were places, the dunes, there was um, reference to the tallest dune in the dune park um, was actually totally taken down and used. And I, not to say anything bad about um, the ball canning company <laughs> and their jars, but that's where they got their sand um, to make the glass to create the ball canning jars, which were made in Indiana. And so that kind of thing about Let's protect the environment because if we don't, it's just going to be gone because of um, industrial development. Um, ultimately, again, yes, they did save, um, again, working with other organizations, they saved that dune area, initially called um, Indiana Dunes State Park. Um, it became a national lakeshore and ultimately the Indiana Dune National Park, which is what they actually were advocating in the beginning. Um, there was one park, Mount Desert Park, which is in, in Maine, Acadia. We know it as Acadia National Park today. And all the other national parks were west of the Mississippi. So they were really advocating, you know, can we get a, a park in the Middle West? And as they referred to Illinois and Indiana at that time. Um, and eventually it did come true. Um, the Geographic Society as well worked to have Starved Rock named a state park. Um, again, looking at the natural environment there and saying this needs to be protected and saved. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but some of you may be familiar with a city or an area called uh, Stony Island in the Chicago area. Um, the Zonia in particular was um, adamant about saving what was known as a Stony Island limestone reef, which is where Stony Island, the, the city is today. And um, she advocated, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, about actually having that named as a state park as well. Um, the minutes, the, those very first minutes you saw, they were handwritten. Well, as you know, time went on, the newer technologies, um, the, these minutes from 1911 were typewritten. Um, but it has specific reference to Zonia and some of her suggestions and what she was asking to, um, that might be done. She thought that, you know, she looked at expanding the society. And in that vein, she was saying, hey, we need to secure an area for a library room. We, we keep getting, you know, there's books and there's pictures that people are giving to us. And so we should have a library that helps to sort out all this stuff and make it available to the public. Um, we still don't have that today, but um, we do have you know vast collections um, of different uh, memorabilia of our society um, in storage and in our archives. She also um, advocated for establishing a research department. Remember, she's thinking of setting this up, something like National Geographic Society. So people would be asking questions and they would like some answers. Um, and she also thought there should be a way that membership could give suggestions to the society about excursions they wanted or other things that the society might do. And it, these things all should sound familiar because these are things we still do today. Um, you know, hoping our membership will um, help provide some new, you know, some new direction and ideas of things that we might do. And then, um, although there were already excursions for the membership. She's and remember her background is as a teacher um, that they should arrange for field excursions for children and for teachers. Um, the ideas were discussed a little bit and then everything was kind of tabled for further discussion. 
So the ideas of what we have today in our society about um, our advocacy and working with um, teachers, with students, with the public in general, these all stem back um, to our very early beginnings. Something else I found interesting is that they have something called post-vacation luncheons in fall. And these appeared over and over again in the scrapbook. Uh, so people would you know, travel in summer and they would have a fall meeting and three or four people might talk about their excursions. Uh, I found that Zonia often was listed on the luncheon committee. She didn't um, speak necessarily, but um, she helped to organize these different meetings. And you had to buy tickets and things like that. It was a very formal um, type of situation. Well, you know, as she's starting this, um, the Geographic Society, she's also still a teacher. She's, you know, going through her own professional growth. So again, she did return to um, Cook County Normal School, and she was training others to become teachers of geography. Most of those people did end up teaching in Chicago. That was sort of um, just sort of the process that was going on. But as she's doing that, as I'm reading through different things about her, you could just see that this is also solidifying her teaching philosophy, um, sort of the philosophy about how geography might be taught overall. Plus, she's working with Colonel Parker, who was very progressive in his ideas in terms of what education should be. And part of that was that students should have these field excursions. So students in terms of the college students, the teachers that who were in preparation to become teachers, to get them out into the field and that there would be classroom discussion. Um, Zonia writes different pamphlets and guidelines and outlines of things. And I think one of the key things that show up over and over and over again um, in her writings, um, you know, of courses of study that, that were published um, is that students should be drawing, they should be painting, they should be reading excerpts about places, they should be sculpting in clay, they should be modeling things in sand, and um, anything to convey that they really understand what geography truly is, um, not just recitation of facts coming back. This image that you see on the right, Zonia is um, here near the front, um, and these are other teachers um, at the Cook County Normal School in 1887. Um, she also decided to take on, you know, some of her own learning to expand her own education. She had her teaching credentials, um, and at that time, that didn't necessarily equate to having um, a degree, but she had the credentials she needed for teaching. And so she was attending classes at the University of Chicago in geography and geology, which were very, very close. It was like one department, so they were very closely related. Um, she didn't graduate with her Bachelor of Science until 1904, but keep in mind that, again, she was teaching, she was um, traveling, she was lecturing, um, she was doing a lot of writing. So the fact that this took, you know, a while, you know, pretty much makes a lot of sense. Um, this picture, which is almost iconic, if you Google Zonia Baber, you're going to see this picture. This is the one that really pops up. Um, it's her um, at Maison Creek, where they were looking for fossils. So it was a geology class. She was in the first field geology class at the University of Chicago that allowed women and also women to go on the field excursions. And so this is really a pretty, you know, it's not only an icon iconic image of her, but really talks, you know, to the times and the fact that she was out there and she was pushing and advocating for women to be part of the sciences. Um, she was described as a famous geography education lecturer. And so you're going to hear throughout this presentation, several different places, multiple places that she went, that she was lecturing. So like in 1893, I mean, so very early on, she was out in Utah and she was doing programs to talk about um, teacher education. Um, she came back in, uh, in 1895 and she with, um, I mentioned Flora Cook, they actually were at this Cook County teachers meeting and the topic of the meeting for all of the teachers in this meeting was seat work. Um, and as I was reading through the information that they had there, it was just so interesting because evidently students would recite things. So they'd go up to the teacher and have a recitation and the rest of the students just stayed in their seats. And I guess they were expected to behave, to be good. Well, they evidently weren't. And so this was the concern. And that's why this particular meeting was like, well, what do you do with the students who are left in their seats and they have nothing to do? Well, both um, Zonia and, her, um, and Flora were like, well, you don't leave them, do nothing. 
you you make sure that there's always something for them to do. Uh, and Zonia strongly advocated, she says, well, have them draw things. They can draw things and, you know, that they see out in nature. Um, think about, you know, all the leaves and all the plants. So she's going back to her, you know, you know, botany, geology, geography roots about this and have sand somewhere where they can go in and they can mold and, you know, sculpture some landscapes um, to do that. She says, you know, even one of her other quotes, you know, teach them about the birds and the bees and insects and how they live and work and let them do something in, her, in their seat work with that. And even Flora, you know, her comment was just even let them play. Don't let them just be sitting there waiting in between these recitations. So again, that whole idea, that whole change in how you would think about education and what kids, students might be doing. So again, this is about the time that the society was formed. Um, she um, was asked to um, teach, most of these um, outside lecturers were done during the summer, um, to go to Hampton, Virginia. Um, and the Hampton Agricultural and Industrial School was again, a very progressive school. Um, it was for uh, African Americans, and to help train this particular. They trained in many, many different things, but she was brought there to help train them to become teachers. And later on, they also accepted Native Americans. So it was a, a very specific school that had some very specific guidelines and goals. Again, this is a picture that pops up often, but until you know a little bit about the background about it. Um, you know, it just looks like, okay, she's sitting there and she's instructing people, but she was thrilled with this. She thought it was great that every um, student there had a globe in their hands. It was more than, you know, a map um, that they could touch the globe. And if you notice the person behind her is pointing on the chalkboard. And so they were studying different declinations of the sun and they could do that. They can ma manipulate um, the globe in their hands. And so again, that whole idea that it's not just reading books or looking at pictures. Um, to get something, even if you're indoors, to have something that's more active. Some of the most fascinating stuff I found out about her teaching um, was the importance of labs and laboratories um, in the classroom. And so this image that we see is in the uh, a basement room at the School of Education at the University of Chicago. Um, and uh, they couldn't go outdoors. It was winter time. And Zonia wanted to, she says, it's one thing to be outdoors and you go and you see a river and you walk that river valley and maybe you walk it all the way from its source to its mouth and you see the changes in the stream flow and the width of the stream and, and, you know, the river banks and all that. She says, but that doesn't show you how it was made. And so she devised this, this, it was called a lab box. Uh, it was constructed with like 17 by 20 feet. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was 17 by 11 feet. I'm sorry. And then in the middle, it was filled um, with different layers, like of cinder, of clay, and of sand. And above it, there was a hose hanging from the ceiling. And below the hose was um, a wire mesh, so the water didn't just come out, you know, like a straight stream. It kind of got dispersed like rainwater. And this, and so they could use that. She could use that to demonstrate how different landforms were shaped and formed because of um, rain. And, you know, so looking at stream flow, seeing how rivers and ponds were formed and things like that. Again, you know, it's pretty innovative um, that you would do something like this um, in a classroom to really get this demonstration idea. Um, she also really encouraged students not just to look at maps and read maps, but to make maps. Um, she saw it as more, I'm sure most of us have filled out, you know, a blank, you know, outline map and putting in names of states or putting dots and adding cities and things like that. She really thought students ought to do their own original cartography. Um, but not only that, to take a map. So if you have a political map saying maybe showing all the states of the United States, you might then make a map showing on top, maybe on top of that, the contours and make a topographic map for the same area. So doing multiple maps showing different aspects of the land. Today, we do that so simply with GIS, where we can add layers and we can do transparent layers so you can see things below it. But she already had that idea back in the late 1800s and early 1900s of there's multiple ways of looking at the earth. And so I love this little picture too, that was part of um, one of, uh, in a they were called course of study where she outlined what teachers ought to teach. And she had this picture of some of her fifth uh, fifth grade students, um, you know, looking at uh, the de declination of the sun and really you know, doing some measurements. 
I said she was lecturing and, you know, every so often you'll see places. So she was kind of all over the United States <clears throat> in the early 1900s, um, all the way from Helena, Montana, um, which I thought was interesting. It wasn't like teachers were required to go for the Institute, but the whole county, anyone in the county was, you know, was open to the public. And again, she was talking about geography and the and how to study nature. Um, she One summer she spent in Tennessee. And again, um, this was a teacher institute for teachers in the South or prospective teachers in the South. The idea was that the South was very hot. So they found a place that would be a little bit more um, suitable in summer temperature wise. And so it was the University of Tennessee for the teachers to come and learn. And again, she was teaching how to teach geography. Um, she went out to Kansas City. She was in St. Joseph, Michigan. She was in Maywood, Indiana. All of these little things are little snippets that come out of the newspaper that, you know, they might be no more than a little, you know, two or three sentences saying that she was doing these things. So, so she may have been doing a lot more than um, what I was able to put on that map. By 1920, she becomes a member of the American Men of Science. Some of you might go, what do you mean American Men of Science? She's a female. Well, there were only a few women who were allowed and invited to join this particular organization. Today, it is known as the American Men and Women of Science. But at that time, it, it was really, you know, mostly a, a men's association. And she was invited to do that because of an article she wrote for the Journal of Geography. The Journal of Geography um, is published by the National Council of Geographic Education. And she proposed renaming what she called renaming the solar circles. So you may recall learning about the equator and the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn and the Arctic and Antarctic circles. She said, okay, equator, people know. Arctic, Antarctic, people know. But the tropics are confusing. She's teaching adults in teacher training classes. And she's working in a lab school with younger kids. She says, it doesn't matter what age. Everyone gets the two confused. They don't know which is which. So I propose we just name it the Northern Tropic and the Southern Tropic. Um, and that's what her article was about. And that's what got her into um, that science society. Um, today, there was no official change ever made. And I have to say, I've never actually seen it listed as Northern Tropic and Southern Tropic, but both are considered acceptable. It was never like disputed or said, no, you can't use those terms. Um, so she brought about that idea. And then and I'm hoping we have some uh, Society of Women Geographers in our group out there. In 1927, she joins that particular society. The Society of Women Geographers was founded in 1925, so just two years earlier, um, by a group of five women who, who were, they had traveled, they had done a, a lot of exploration, um, and traveled the world. And what they found is they were not accepted into any of the organizations like the Explorers Club because they were exclusively for men. So these five women formed their own society of women geographers. That society still um, exists today. And in fact, last uh, our last speaker, uh, Caroline Torkelson, is a member of that. And she spoke about Annie Smith um, Peck, who also was a member of that. Uh, anyway, um, after the society was formed, um, Zonia writes to them and says, you know, men and women have different perspectives um, when they see things. And every time they were trying to get new speakers for the Geographic Society of Chicago, most often they were men because men were the people who were doing most of the publishing and were doing those studies in science. Um, women weren't totally excluded. It was just there were a lot fewer of them. So she wrote to Harriet Adams, the first president of SWG, and said, hey, do you have do you know of any women we can invite to come to the you know, Geographic Society of Chicago and speak? Um, Harriet Adams herself was one of the speakers that did come. And in the process, Zonia also, you know, uh, joined um, that the organization, the Society of Women Geographers, and she was a li lifelong member of that as well. Um, there's a number of bulletins, and I was going through them basically just to kind of confirm that she was still a member over many years. Um, and in one of the later ones, uh, so 1951, um, you know, to every society member, you're asked every year to submit, you know, to update your information, um, your address and all that, but also what you've been doing. Have you published anything? Um, and what are some of your goals? And in the 1951 um, bulletin, she specifically said, 
Um, her special subject was an achievement of national and international friendship amongst uh, nations throughout the world. That's her special subject. So you can see that, you know, she's no longer teaching at that time, but she's, her interests um, revolve around this international um, friendship of nations. And she further stated, you know, still working towards the furtherance of world peace and an active member of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, which we'll talk about in a little bit a little bit later. But she was even, you know, um, sharing those ideas with these other organizations as she joined them. Well, something else that she did, I found actually pretty fascinating. Um, is she invented a student desk. Now you might say, how do you invent a desk? Desks are desks. She said, wait a minute, in geography, in geology, we need a desk that's going to hold sand, that's going to hold clay, that has all the things that students need besides their books and just a surface to write on. So she invented this desk. It does have a patent on it um, in her name that not only had, you know, where the cover could lift off and it could lift off in different ways. So it could go sideways or whatever, but it had a rim around it. So if you built things on top of that desktop, they would kind of be contained in there. Um, it also had the ink well. It had a water well, so you could add water, like if you're working with sand or clay. Um, and it had a box on it that could hold clay or a bo another box on it that could hold sand. So that students had those things right at their disposal at their desk. Kind of an interesting idea. And I think, you know, she comes up with teaching from books or earth itself is no longer debatable. She knew teaching from earth itself, that hands-on, um, first-hand observation was the most important thing to a geographer. There's a lot of things out there. They're written, they're called the course of study. And later on, um, the name was changed to the elementary school teacher. So there's a little bit of overlap there. And she started writing in those regularly. Um, there were 10 volumes each year. There were other um, college professors that were writing in them. It was the course of study. It's what you teach. And, and how it should be taught. These are published by the Chicago, at first the Chicago Institute, and then by the University of Chicago. And again, she focuses so much on hands-on um, learning, taking excursions and, and doing that type of thing, the, the field work. And so she does talk about, you know, there is a time for indoor work, you can't be outside, but it should be from your observations that were made when you were out of doors. You know, so it's not that she she didn't despise books. She just saw too much was rote learning. And she was trying to say, use books, you know, um, to help develop knowledge. But then you need this other type of um, learning as well. A lot of tactile kinds of things. Um, use sand and chalk modeling. Um, study processes. Study in the field. And so, for, for example, in the region of Chicago, she took... Her, her college students who were going to be teachers. So they were in teacher training and she'd take them to Winnetka and Glencoe. And I saw a lot of overlap here with the Geographic Society of Chicago. They did some of these same excursions. Um, so, you know, she pr probably got a little bit more bang for a buck and taking them there. But the idea is, you know, Winnetka, Glencoe, Highland Park is looking at those ravines and the gullies and the process of erosion, you know, go to the West shore of Lake Michigan and, um, Notice the wave action. How do shorelines form? How did be you know what's the beach action? Where, where is the erosion? And then looking at the south end of Lake Michigan, so the the dunes um, in Indiana, but there's also a lot of evidence of glacial drift, and you can look at the quarries. And she took him to Stony Island um, <clears throat> before it was uh, covered with homes and things like that because it was a natural outcropping of of a limestone reef. And they'd look at the Chicago Lighthouse and the crib and the harbor. Um, she used the Chicago River and the Des Plaines River, both of those, in terms of looking at river flow and um, looking at drainage. And then we call it the Field Museum, but at that time it was called the Field Columbia Museum, you know, taking, you know, getting into a museum and looking at other specimens. So on the left, you see this is just a, a snippet of one of um, these courses of study. And she focused... Um, a lot of her work initially on um, primary grades, early grades, but she wrote everything all the way from first grade all the way through high school and then even for college instruction. But I thought this was interesting. This was an autumn curriculum. And for first grade, you want to acquaint students with the environment in Chicago. So you would take them out to Lake Michigan 
and they could visit the shoreline and think about shipping and protection of sailors. <clears throat> and then go out to a farm, visit a farm and look at what a harvest is and look at the animals. But in second grade, when you take them to a farm, have students specifically focus on how crops are stored and different ways of harvesting different kinds of crops. When you go to Lake Michigan, look at the work of the waves and how you build beaches and the swamps and the prairies um, that are associated, especially when you get to Indiana Dunes. Um, by third grade, still looking at agriculture, but you know, look at threshing on the farm. And not only that, that pupils might husk and shock, shock the corn themselves and uh, maybe even do some planting of, of corn. I don't, I don't know that, um, that they plant corn in fall so much, but she was advocating that. And even looking at the forested regions and thinking about how trees are felled and what happened, you know, and then comparing that to a tropical forest, which they couldn't see. So take from what you know and can see and observe and tra transfer that information to a place that's a little bit more obscure. In fourth grade, the same thing. So she built this curriculum and each, you know, where could you go and what would you do with that information? And these appeared over and over again. So I, I love this. This is, this is her desk. Um, and, you know, with the clay modeling, on it that students are modeling clay. You notice a little uprise. There's a ridge around it, so nothing's going to slide out. And um, I thought that that was so so cool to see students actually working. On, they had their own desk, and they could do their own models. Um, she didn't believe in that cookie cutter kind of recitation kind of thing. She looked at school. She says they like factory schools, and they want everyone to do the same thing. And um, she was trying to, to bring out, you know, she didn't really talk about bringing out creativity, but to engage students in their learning. This is the other thing when she kept talking about chalk modeling, when I'd be reading through those course of study things, I kept, what in the heck is chalk modeling? Well, here it is on the chalkboard. This um, also appeared, she, in some of um, the course of studies, there would be a picture every so often about, you know, how to do something. And so drawing on the board and, um, and look at the shading that's on there. So chalk modeling is to actually, you know, be on the chalkboard and to, to show different things. So she authored a lot of different articles. Um, one that she's pretty well known for is called The Scope of Geography. And I think, again, I see this kind of thing all, over and over again. She wrote this in 1904. We're in 1923. And some of this stuff still applies. <laughs> Um, you know, she says geography has moved up and down the scale of educational importance since the time of the Athenians. And we have seen that it becomes important at certain times. Um, uh, if we're talking about industry and we're looking for places to locate new businesses, all of a sudden the, the landscape and the geography becomes important. Um, times of war or civil unrest, we're looking at the geography and the lay of the land in terms of of how that's going to play into um, any of those scenarios. And so she was seeing that, you know, very early on, you know, geography has never occupied the first place in the school curriculum as a cultural subject, but in rare instances, its utility has given it the highest status. And, and I think that that's it. We, geography is, is a subject that we use and, um, and that's hence all that field work. Now, meanwhile, I've been talking about her and some things that she's been doing, but remember she came back to the Cook County Normal School in the late 1800s. She was uh, teaching there. Colonel Francis Parker, who you see here, was um, the head of the Cook County Normal School, and he had a cadre of teachers. They were all doing progressive things in training other teachers. Um, in 19, I'm sorry, 1899, Anita McCormick Blaine, who lived on the north side of Chicago, um, got in touch with Francis Parker and said, I want to establish a new normal school. So remember, normal school is a school for teacher training. I want to put it on the north side and teacher, and we're going to establish a private um, school for students, younger students to attend that teachers can use. And then I want some of those teachers in their training to also go to other schools around the city. Um, I want it, she wanted it to be very progressive. And he agreed to um, take it on and to build that school. Uh, the school was, uh, as you see here in the picture, today it's called the Francis Parker School. It still exists. on the, It's on the north side of Chicago. Um, but initially it was called the Chicago Institute. Um, and so again, that was, it was a private school for training teachers or people to become teachers. Um, he also hired, he wanted the best progressive teachers 
which he had been working with already at the um, Cook County Normal School. So he recruited from there. He not only Zonia, but maybe 10 or 12 other teachers um, from the Cook County Normal School. Um, he recruited for the Chicago Institute, including Flora Cook, who um, he did find to be an excellent teacher, but he recruited her to become um, principal of the Chicago Institute. Well, here's the thing. Um, when uh, Anita Blaine made this proposal, it was 1899, but the school hadn't even been built yet. And so any of the teachers that were hired had a year paid sabbatical to prep for 1900 when the school would open. And so um, the teachers went all over, it depended on their specific study. Some of them went to Cambridge for a year. Some of them went to Yale. Some did some traveling. Um, and in terms of traveling, that's what Zonia did. She and Emily Rice traveled. A, they did a world tour. They went around the world. Um, and that was in because they were both teaching geography. And the goal was to learn about the topography, the landscape, and the people around the world. So they left from Chicago. They She stopped in uh, Neodesha, Kansas to go visit her sister for a short while. And then um, she went to, she and Emily went to Hawaii. In fact, um, her friend Flora Cook was in Hawaii as well. Flora stayed there and actually taught and worked and did some stuff in Hawaii as part of her sabbatical. Um, and so um, she lectured um, in Hawaii. They then traveled to Japan um, where they actually experienced a typhoon. They went to China. She saw the Great Wall of China. She um, saw different uh, regions. She saw where the Boxer Rebellion was held and made some, you know, um, she wrote some things about how the, the famine that was there probably helped to contribute a great deal to that Boxer Rebellion. Traveled to Indonesia and traveled the whole length of the, um, the island of Java, um, went back up like to Burma, um, and heard the bills of Mandalay, um, traveled to India and was in several places in India, actually. Um, and again, she saw areas of just horrific famine. Um, you know, when she was writing about it, she says, you know, the people were just reaching out and they needed help. But there's really nothing as travelers that they could do much to help them. But there was a great famine going on at that time in that particular area. And she comments on the fact that, um, if it wasn't for their religion, these people would, would not be experiencing famine, famine. But because their religion prohibited the eating of, uh, slaughtering, eating of animals, um, they had, you know, the grains and things weren't growing. And so there was just a great famine in the area. And they went to um, Ceylon, which is today uh, Sri Lanka, um, over to Egypt. Um, they passed through, at that time, this it was called Palestine. The country was called Palestine. So um, and then up into Turkey, over to Greece, Serbia, um, Hungary, um, forgetting one of my places here, um, Austria, and then they ended up in Paris, France, uh, from where they took off and, and came home. So it was quite a trip. It was 11 months long. She had all these different modes of transportation, and she commented on how riding a camel and riding an elephant both were equally as nause nauseating. She says they both made her like seasick um, in terms of riding them. She says what she really enjoyed riding was the donkey. Um, if she couldn't be in a car, <laughs> riding the donkey was like the next kind of transportation she thought was pretty good. And I guess she was riding a donkey in, in China and stuff like that. But they did everything. So a jin rickshaw is a rickshaw. And then the palanquin, you know, um, you know, they had every kind of um, transportation. It was it had to be quite a trip. Well, when they come back again, other things are going on in Chicago. Um, so 1900, they come back. Um, the uh, Chicago Institute is open, they're teaching there. And um, the University of Chicago approaches the um, the Institute and says, um, come join us. So Dewey, the Dewey Decimal System, had a lab school at the University of Chicago and invites them um, to join forces. And so that's how Zonia actually became a faculty member of uh, in geography and geology at the University of Chicago. Actually, she was in the School of Education. Um, it was because these two different teaching um, institutes joined together. This is at the dedication of the School of Education. They're guests here. So these other women are actually guests. Um, Zonia's in the, the back row, and I kind of 
highlighted her picture because I thought it was kind of odd. She is the, when you look at all the, first of all, everyone else there is a man. And second of all, she's the only one wearing, she's like wearing her mortar board. The only thing I can think of is that women wore hats. And so she had to be in this robe um, as a professor. So I'm assuming that's why she wore that. I just thought it was kind of a, you know, it's one of those social statements. Um, a couple of years later, she was actually chosen to, you know, to act as the, uh, become the principal of the elementary school. So there was that lab school or demonstration school as part of this, uh, the Chicago School of Education. Ten years later, the faculty of that School of Education, and she's in the back row, um, again, the only woman. So she's very progressive. I mentioned she had that lab box in the basement. This was actually written up in the Chicago Trib. Um, she evidently took her students out to a, lot, a big park, you know, an open area near the um, university, and they had a pile of sand, and she had a hose hooked up to a fire hydrant of some sort, and um, she was demonstrating to them. So she delfly, you know, could handle that hose, and she was, you know, throwing that stream of water on this pile of sand to help d demonstrate how streams um, formed. So again, that, you know, to to look at. Um, you know, how things are formed was a, a very crucial part of what she was doing. She's continuing during all that time as well, traveling to other places, a few more that I found in terms of going even to Mexico, where she's uh, talk, taught at the Mexican National University in the summer um, to for a few people. Well, she also had another first. She led some field trips. She was the first female to lead a geological expedition out of the University of Chicago. So not only was she the first woman to be on one at that university, but now she's leading them. And she took um, 30, initially 13 students to Lake Superior, but then a few years later, she took others on a month long trip all the way out to um, Washington, DC. And I grabbed this picture from um, the article she published because just this fall, just with a month ago, I was in this new river canyon. Today, it's New River uh, Gorge National Park and saw this same view, not quite in black and white. Um, you know, so it's sort of like I wasn't following in her footsteps, but I keep coming across things that are so similar um, in places I've been or in methods of teaching. She did retire from teaching at about age 56. Um, uh, something I read just said it was a physical disability due to an accident. I'm sorry, it was age 59. Um, so 59 is a pretty respectable age anyway to be retiring at. And, you know, so it's sort of like, okay, what'd she do the rest of the time? Well, she, again, she continued to travel. She went um, on this transcontinental trip um, with other geographers that went to these six cities um, she was one of 75 women out of 750 people. So again, kind of, you know, you can see that um, she was doing things that most women didn't do. Um, one of the cities on that expedition were, were in Chicago. So she was took a lead role in helping um, to set up what people did while they were in the city of Chicago. She went out to California with her sister, brother-in-law, and nephew, and they stopped at Portland, Oregon, where the Lewis and Clark expedition was um, being held. And then she went on to Alaska. Uh, all of them went on to Alaska. Um, she was in Spitsbergen. That's what the name at the time today, we call it Svalbard, which um, are some islands north of Norway in the Arctic Ocean. She was studying glaciation. So even if she wasn't teaching, she was still doing all this stuff. Um, she traveled with the British Association for the Advancement of Science um, to uh, New Zealand, Australia, Tasmania, and Tahiti. So this is just an image of um, in Brisbane, where they had an outdoor gathering of people. And if I had to pick a favorite statement, it's this. There are only two subjects, humans and nature, and they are united by geography. And um, again, there were so many things that I thought, man, this is how I feel. Well, she was an activist, was one of the things. Um, for the Geographic Society of Chicago, again, getting Starved Rock declared um, a state park, you know, photographs, they, uh, the Geographic Society um, wrote little pamphlets um, to go along with it and share. Her thing that she really wanted to see was Stony Island become a state park. So I kind of superimposed Stony Island without the capital letters was is literally a limestone reef that stands about 20 feet high off of the surface 
of the land. So um, imagine there are no homes and streets here when she's there. And it, so there was just this stony thing and it was a reef. It's pretty unique. And she really wanted to save it. And she really, really wanted it to be an area of a state park. And so this is 1912. She starts this campaign. Oops, sorry. I really kind of zoomed ahead here. Um, starts this campaign. <laughs> sorry, we're still going back here. Um, they write the pamphlet. There's, It's called excursion number or um, pamphlet number three. Um, published by the Geographic Society of Chicago, and she talks about its unique vegetation. Very well written, talks in depth about the geology of the area. Um, she writes letters to different committees, um, specifically to the South Park commissioners about why it should be saved. So this is like 1913. 1914, there's a, you know, the Geographic Society is also behind this, and they're publishing letters and trying to get the park commissioners to, you know, advocate for this. 1917, there's a news article and another letter. The 1920s, the matter was still never resolved. The South Park commissioners never accepted the proposal to save that stony island. And so what you see now are, is sort of the, the outline, the topographic features, um, but everything there now are roads and streets. There's like three schools that are on this um, area that in that they're sitting on that limestone reef today. Um, the Geographic Society, as I mentioned, worked um, with the, uh, they wanted to get the Dunes National Park organized. And so there were several expeditions um, of people who went out there. She worked with Henry Calls for a while, who also is from the University of Chicago. And again, she was on multiple committees um, that were advocating um, to save the parks. And I had talked about this a little while ago, but again, the idea was a national park somewhere in the middle of the country and um, multiple organizations worked on this. Um, the Dunes Park did become an Indiana State Park in 1926. Um, it became the National Lakeshore in 1966, so 60 years later. And then in 2019, it was designated as Indiana Dunes National Park. So something that she advocated and the Geographical Society advocated for very early on in the 1900s. She was also a social activist. So she's teaching, she's doing all this stuff, this activism with the Geographic Society of Chicago. And she's also out there, again, she's become very much uh, you know, active like in the suffragette movement. Um, she joined the Illinois Equal Suffrage Association who was advocating for city cleanliness and beautification. And they'd go into neighborhoods and do cleanups. Um, and she firmly believed, I mean, at this time, she's also advocating that geography can unite the world. If you understand geography, the physical geography, and you understand people and cultures and, and heritages, that you could unite the world. And so she even writes this article, Lost Opportunities in Teaching Geography, because if we don't teach it, then there becomes this race prejudice that builds up and, um, you know, the nationalist movement. Well, this is something totally out of character that occurs in 1917. This article is in the, the Chicago Tribune titled Knife in Hand, Pacifist Chides Man as Savage. Oh, my goodness. I can't even imagine what this looked like. I can only, you know, in my mind, I can imagine it. She's speaking to the Women's Bar Association in Chicago. And um, this is not too long after the United States entered World War I in 1917. I think she's speaking to them in December here. And she just starts talking about men as savages. She has a knife in her hand. And I guess she's you know, kind of punctuating her remarks with this knife. And she didn't puncture anything that I know of. Um, but, you know, she was, you know, she was, I guess, just beside herself and the role that she felt men played in um, stimulating or causing war to be per perpetuated. And she just felt send missionaries, not soldiers. Um, besides being a suffragette in the United States, um, she worked with Congress to uh, get a bill passed for Puerto Rican women. Um, they were a territory, and um, but that they should have the ability to vote as well as the men in Puerto Rican territory. So she not only helped to um, get that bill passed in the U.S. Congress, but she traveled to Puerto Rico and advocated for that. Um, she was on the executive committee of the NAACP in Chicago. And so we get this you know, you kind of getting it. She's no longer in the teaching realm, but she has this huge, still has this huge mission ahead of her in terms of um, helping people understand other people. 
And, um, and so she works with the Chicago women's club. She's a member of that. And um, they had a, the Negro in art week, which was, it wasn't just paintings. It was also music and dance and literature. And then she takes another trip um, to South Africa. And again, at this point, you know, and this, these are her words to study the colored races of the South and East of the dark continent. And so she uh, goes there in particular to gather information and um, to help her cause in terms of how she could um, help erase or eradicate racism uh, and to, to help bring about peace. Um, after she was there at that Congress, she extended her trip and went to Kashmir, India. Um, a friend had evidently accompanied her. Uh, There's no indication of which friend. It just, she wrote this letter back to um, the the president of uh, George Utley, the president of the GSC at that time and his wife and was sharing her um, what she did on her trip. And so she includes these postcards in there and is talking about this trail to Kashmir and how it was blocked by stone. And the postcards kind of show, you know, um, some of the cities. And then they uh, got to Kashmir and they rented a houseboat that was pulling a kitchen boat along with it and a rowboat. She says, this is similar in her postcard. She wrote, these are similar to the kind that we had. And they just spent time going along um, a river. Um, and again, she's sending postcards back um, within her letter to George Utley about what she's seen. She was amazed at seeing the Himalayas um, and the snow at top. And um, they ended up in Angkor Wat um, as part of that. But while they were on this river going through it, she wrote, um, she said, um, you know, it was just a curtain of trees along the riverbanks. They just put on their gorgeous autumn dress, poplars and lemon yellow, cherries, uh, cherry trees and red, gold and mauve, while the mulberry and the walnut are still green, but were eclipsed by the bril brilliancy and beauty. And we ourselves could not get our fill of looking at it. And then some nightingales came and landed on the houseboat and started singing. And she said, kind of brought us back to reality. And so it's a quote that she says, if there be heaven on earth, this is it. This is it. This is it. So, you know, she, she sends this information back to George Utley in a four page letter in which she apologizes for it being so long. But it, I mean, she's just explaining the whole trip that she was on. She's in the, the Women's League for um, Peace and Freedom, uh, International, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And she's often on the program to speak and attends different Goodwill dinners. Um, and this is another little interesting story. Just stick with me for another little story. So in 1936, there's an article that appears written by J.A. Rogers, who wrote a small pamphlet book um, called The Superman to Man. And he wrote that back in 1917. Well, Zonia used that book while she was teaching. And he, I'm not sure why he was writing this article, but in it, he refers to her and then says she was a true friend of the Negro. She uses her influence for promoting um, better understanding. And she actually had written to him in 1917 and says, hey, I would like to have 14 copies of this. I'm using this in my class. It's required reading. And he was so impressed by that. And um, she even invites him to her class um, to come and speak along with um, some other people of different nationalities to speak to her students. And again, she was just, even early on, so concerned with how people um, treated other people and that true understanding of people. We have a couple more you know, things that she was, was part of, again, in terms of being, you know, being a pacifist, but also an activist and trying to bring about that change. Um, the final part of this is really looking at her as a peacemaker, as part of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Um, again, so she had pretty much just retired from teaching. She's appointed to the International Executive Committee of this organization, which is still um, going on. She travels to multiple places. She is not in this image, but she was here in um, Switzerland where this picture was taken. Jane Addams is in this picture. So she's a contemporary and knows Jane Addams. I mean, there's so many overlaps of other people that she interacted with. And um, and so she spent the rest of her life, you know, from 1921 on really working for this organization um, to bring peace um, and help people understand what peace might be. Um, so here she was uh, representing the Pan-American branch of um, 
that International League of Peace and Freedom and speaking in Monterey about, um, you know, bringing about permanent peace. She's in the middle of this picture. And along those lines, then she starts plotting where peace, you know, things that were peace symbols. And in 1937, she publishes a small pamphlet that was called Peace Symbols. But by 1948, she actually has a small, it's not a hardcover book, but a book that she self-published um, that has 40 different peace symbols from around the world. Um, and then she dedicated that book um, to peace and then, you know, to this organization in particular. So the very first peace monument that's in her book is this one of the goddess of peace that's in Athens, Georgia. Um, and so you can see she added little, you know, little markers to her map. Her favorite peace memorial was the Columbian Peace Plow from the Columbian Exposition in Chicago because it contained uh, melted down swords, 22,000 swords, it says. And then it, in the handles, it had wooden relics that were, I guess, somehow put into the, the melding of that. But this was one of her favorite um, peace symbols was that peace plow. And just to, you know, you know how the book looks, you know, one side is some description and the other side is, is a picture that she's taken. I love this picture. I have no, it just showed up in something I was looking at. There's no designation of where she's at, how old she is, where it was taken, anything like that. But what a great picture of her. She was honored by the Geographic Society in 1948 with the highest honor that we have, and that's the um, Helen Culver Medal. I believe we have only awarded, we being the Geographic Society of Chicago, we have only awarded five of these. Um, the most recent one was to Bill Curtis, um, maybe 10 years ago or so. And prior to that, the prior person was like Zonia Baber. We It was also, um, I know one went to um, Perry and another one to Amelia Earhart and um, now I can't remember who else the other ones, but but we've it's only it's a very very high honor for our organization, and it was due to the you know her founding of this organization on its fiftieth anniversary in nineteen forty eight. Um, Flora Cook um, narrated the tribute to her. So Nara Cook again you know kind of keeps filtering in and out as I read things about Zonia. As I said, she moved to East Lansing to be with her her niece, and uh, she died in nineteen fifty six. Um, at age 93. So she lived a very long life. And both the Tribune and the East Lansing newspaper, just, you know, small obituary. Um, and she's, someone else's, she was cremated. Um, I'm still trying to figure out who Helen S. Baber is here. It's not her sister. Um, and it's not her niece, because her niece's name um, had Muncie on it, because she was married. So still, that part is a little bit unknown. But I hope you've learned a lot about the many, many faces of Zonia Baber, what she's meant to the, you know, the founding of the Geographic Society, what she's meant even beyond that, even if there was no Geographic Society, her contributions that she made to geography education, um, to peace and understanding, and um, just to bring about change in the world in many, many ways. I have a few people I want to thank for um, helping me with a few things. Lucy Stanfield um, did some research at the Newberry Library, especially about, especially about her trip to Casimir. Um, so she shared some of her images with me. Mary Van Bogoy, um, the former SWG executive, she when I went to visit a little bit over a year ago or so, she was very helpful in providing information and, and subsequent um, even some internet information for me. Um, the GSC staff and Nicolette, who's our moderator here, I believe was the one who carried and retrieved all those archive boxes and brought them to the GSC office. And that's just the GSC in itself for inviting me to do this presentation, um, which I've just, I just enjoyed so much um, finding out about, about Sonia. So thank you very much. I'm sorry. I, I know I went over time a little bit. Um, I hope you're still hanging on. We are still here and so happy too. My goodness, that was the fascinating fantastic, Judy. Yeah. So amazing. Uh, thank you again so much for presenting today. And um, we have some time, uh, a little bit of time for some questions. Okay. So sure. go ahead and toss questions into the, uh, the box here. I do have uh, one from Joanna. Is there a significant Zonia Baber archive in existence? 
or any researchers conducting work on her life and professional contributions? Um, everything I found was pretty erratic. Um, I, I pulled from many, many different resources, um, but there is no book written about her. We know that. Um, and a lot of stuff just gives some dates and kind of general information. So pretty much what I did, I was pulling from multiple resources to try to bring it all together. So nothing specific. There is no specific one archive about her that I could find. Uh, what do you think Zonia Baber would say about the GIS technology of today? <laughs> She'd say, go for it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> She she was innovative. She thought that you should use, I mean, she would want you out in the field looking at those things, but she would love that you could take. Um, so one of the things I know I use with my students is something called survey one, two, three, where it's GIS and you set up your map and questions on the computer, but then you have students in the field collecting information and data on their cell phones, on their mobile devices. And then you go back and look at it on a map and you look at patterns and you can analyze data. And I think that's where she was at. It's like using, you know, that she would use the technology. It shouldn't dictate what we do or be the only thing or just learn a skill of how to do, how to make a map on GIS. It would be use it for your advantage to learn something. So I, I, mm. I she would want you to be in the field though, collecting that data and not just, you know, nose on the computer. <laughs> Awesome. We have a lot of great thank yous from uh, from everyone at the organization. Super awesome presentation. And yes, uh, if there are no more questions, doesn't look like we have any. Let me double check. All right. Thank you again for presenting, Judy. Really oh, appreciate it. It was fantastic.